They're also in the ACC. All right, let's just do two bubble teams. We'll, we'll go with Wake first. My God, man. <laughs> Very Wake disappointed Forest. in them. Wake Forest dropped its third straight game. It dropped its fifth game in its last seven. It loses 70 to 69 to Georgia Tech. It does this after playing with its food to start this game, man. Georgia Tech went on a 14-0 run. It was what? It was like 24 to 9, 24 to 6 early on. Wake Forest at home at the Joel, where it had not been it had not been vulnerable to any kind of defeat. 70 to 69. They come back. They come all the way back. They finally take their first lead in the final minute of the damn game. And they can't get it done, man. Just a, a crazy shot by by Ndongo, by the way. <laughs> the, the shot that went in, <laughs> that fell down. Damon Stoudemire. Georgia Tech is 14 and 16, but it has a win against Duke. It has a win against Clemson on the road. It has a win against UNC, has defeated Wake Forest. Uh, again, like I, we mentioned this, you know, I think it was after the Duke win, maybe. Um there's just like good signs moving forward. Yeah. You know, it's a sub 500 team. It's not a great debut season. He's not knocking. He's not Danny Sprinkle over here, but it's good. Good indications there. Wake Forest, though. You're the story. What is going on, man? Like 18 and 12. It just refuses to put together an at large worthy resume. There's another would be bubble team. I want to get to in a second. But uh, any thoughts on other than the obvious ones, I guess, about the Demon Deacons just dude, they was right there for them. I disappointed is the right word, Parish man. At Notre Dame, at Virginia Tech, home against Georgia Tech. Just go two and one. That's they right. went oh and they went oh and three. They're not first four out. Like they're beyond that now at this point. They they host Clemson this weekend. They have to win that. And they almost certainly need to win two games in the ACC tournament to get back on the better side of the bubble. Yeah, it's it's rough. And they've done this to themselves. I mean, it was set up for them. They beat Duke, they stormed the court, and then it's like, all right, you're playing a bad team next. And then, uh, you know, the Virginia Tech thing, like, whatever. You, you, it's a road game against a not awful team. Like, lose that one. I don't care. But you can't lose all of these. And now they've lost three straight. Um, they've got Clemson at home this weekend. That's that's an opportunity to, you know, turn it back the other direction. It's also an opportunity for you to take a four-game losing streak into the ACC tournament. It's just... um you, you can't – we were in studio and, like, you know, Anthony Billis is in studio with us. He's a Wake Forest alum, so he's obviously locked in on it. It was a fun night because we had Anthony locked in on Wake and Brent Stover locked in on Kansas State. You know, they're fighting for their lives, both these clubs. And, um, obviously, Kansas State got, got run pretty good by Kansas. But it's, you see Wake go down so early. Like, yo, man, they're down – it's 2 nothing, 6 nothing, nine, whatever it was. You know, it's like – what are you doing? You're at home. And it's like, where are they playing this? What at home? They're down 12, nothing at home, the Georgia Tech. So you just got to fight the whole game to get back in it. And then Hunter Salas was a, like, he made one big play after another late and it looked like he won it. And you just need one stop. Mm -hmm. And then, it, you know, I, I don't mind the way they guarded the final possession, you know, just, it was just a young man hitting a nice, like hitting a, hitting a big time shot. But if you're awake and you're this close to getting where you want to get to, you just can't put yourself in a situation where, where you have to battle back the whole game and then where you're at risk of losing at the buzzer the way they did. It was just – it's a rough night and what's been a rough stretch. And now they're going to have to go to the ACC tournament. And I don't know if they got to win it, but no, they got – they got yeah, they got to go far. They got to go really far. They'll have to win it if they lose at home to Clemson. Uh, what's wild is like Wake Forest is – talented enough to win the ACC tournament. So maybe that happens and they get in that way. Um, I, I actually think there's, it's not, un, it's not unthinkable that that would happen. Um, there's a little uh, comments in the chat about Pitt. Pitt did win at home against FSU. It's 20 and 10. It's got more work to do, but you know, uh, on the outskirts there, another team that's on the outskirts. <sighs> this, this, this team was on our network last night. UNLV is a wagon. UNLV is 10 and one in its last 11 games. It's only loss is by three points at home to Nevada. I'm I'm it's not in the bubble picture yet, but I'm going to ask you if it should be. This team has a win against Creighton in the non-con. It has defeated New Mexico twice. It has a win over Boise state. 
It has a win against San Diego State, has a win against Colorado State. If you want the quad numbers, here's your breakdown on UNLV right now. It's three and four in quad one, five and one in quad two. It is, no, sorry, my, my mistake. I'm looking at the wrong team. It is five and three in quad one, one and four in quad two. It's reverse. So it's six and seven in the first two quadrants. That's a better mark in the top two quads than a lot of teams that are in the tournament right now. The problem is it is seven and three in quad four. So the quad four losses are rightfully dragging it down. Its metrics don't suggest it should be in the at-large conversation just yet because its best one from a team sheet perspective is KPI where it's 59. It's 83 in strength of record. Again, those quad three losses or quad four losses will anchor you to the bottom of the ocean. 77 in the net, 64 BPI, 75 Ken Palm. Not there, but UNLV is fascinating, Parish because it has a better collection of wins than many of the teams on either side of the cut line. But that's why every game matters. And it's why I believe there's a little more talk about like, maybe we should go back to like, okay, you kind of, you're building your team towards something. And so what you will show yourself to be in the back half of your schedule, you know, February into March, that's who you are. Maybe we should have a little bit of weight to it. I push back on that because it would diminish November and December even more. I think that is a is an imperative for college basketball to keep those games to have actual meaning that is identical as best it can be through uh, a committee that votes on this stuff, GP. Because um, otherwise, what would be the motivation to play those games, you know? So I don't think that we should discard that. But UNLV is a fascinating case. That being said, it's fascinating in that this team now is operating like one of the 30 best teams in the country but it does not have one of the 50 or 60 best resumes. It plays at Nevada on Saturday. I think we will have to, if it wins at Nevada, I think we are going to, uh, I think we have to have a fair discussion about if it should be in the field, because I promise you if they win at Nevada and we took that resume and we compared it against a team in a power conference, even with the three Q fours GP, I think we would be debating that team more heavily than we are. You and your thoughts on the game and just, the fascinating resume that is the running rebels. They're great right now. It may be great's too strong of a word, but they are like Mount West Conference Tournament. It's going to be played in Thomas. Did you hear it's going to be played at Thomas and Mount? In fact, keep keep talking, GP. Not a throw this Torvik tweet up on the on the screen as well because it's got the percentages of winning this thing. Um, it's incredible. But uh, but yeah, keep it going. It is at Thomas and Mac. I am aware. Like, would you take? Would you pick them maybe to win the Mountain West Conference Tournament right now? <laughs> they would I mean, be they're 10 and 1 in their last 11. They have, have home court advantage. They just beat San Diego State at home. And not like, you know, they got lucky doing They just beat them. They just beat them the whole game, basically. They guarded them from the jump. Like, there's a real purpose with what that team's doing right now. Like, you watch them, and they don't look like a team with three quadrant four losses. But they are a team with three quadrant four losses. I saw um, Doug Gottlieb tweet late last night that Nevada – um. UNLV this weekend is a play-in game. Well, I don't think that's quite right because Nevada's in no matter what, so they ain't playing to get in anything. Right. Nevada, Nevada could lose. New Mexico is on the cut line right now. Um. Uh. So, and then UNLV, I don't think even with a win is in. Like they're they're seventy ninth in the net or seventy seventh in the net. Teams in the seventies from outside the Power Four or even Power Five. Or even Power Six, they don't get they don't get into the NCAA tournament in the seventies in the net. Um, so it's awesome that they're playing really well lately, and they do have five quadrant one wins. That's the same number that Duke has. It's the same number that Kentucky has. But those three quadrant four losses, like you said, they they just they tie you to the bottom of the ocean. And I understand the the philosophy with. But what are we watching? This is clearly one of the best, what would it have to be, 36 at-large teams in the country if you just base it on what we're watching right now and what's happening right now. But I would just counter that by asking you, what other sport, mainstream sport in America, do we say what happened early doesn't matter? It's not right. really something we do. No, the whole schedule matters. So just like, and, you know, basketball is different because of how many teams I get all that. But no, like it's your, your record is your record and you get in based on the wins. And there you yeah. go. So yeah, we should not we should not change that. I've heard that a little bit more, um, but that shouldn't be the case it, for everyone listening, not watching. Uh, we've got uh, the the simulator for the Mountain West tournament uh, via Torvik's uh, magic machine here. I bet you didn't even know you could do this on Torvik, did you? Another I way heard. of starting data right here, GP. 
I heard about it. Okay, here, look at that. Look at that far right column. Look at the percentages that there's a chance the champion to come out of the tournament right now. Utah State, Nevada, thirteen point seven percent. New Mexico, thirteen point two percent. UNLV, fourteen point nine, which is ahead of Boise State at twelve point nine. Colorado State is ahead of them at 10.6. And then San Diego State right now, 20.7%. That championship percentage on the far right column is insanity. That you will not have like you will not have a single other conference that has a, that even of a disparity across four plus teams. That just shows you how balanced this is. And I think UNLV's number might be juiced a couple of percentage points by nature of the fact that it's playing in its home building. But that is incredible, man. You want to talk about the most entertaining conference in America, which I've been saying is the Mountain West for weeks and weeks and weeks. This only reinforces that. Um, so right here, per Torvik, UNLV is the second most likely Mountain West tournament champion as of right now. Pretty crazy. Yeah, like I don't think there's another league in the country, and there's rarely ever a league in the country where you can say that seven teams can reasonably hope to win it. The six that are projected to make the NCAA tournament right now out of the Mountain West and then the home team, UNLV, which is arguably, if not undeniably, playing better than anybody else right now. So if you told me um, UNLV wins this, I wouldn't be surprised by that at all. But if you told me UNLV was able to bid on that large resume by uh, while not winning this, that, that kind of would. Because it, you can argue and debate – the principles that the selection committee is instructed to use. But once, and you might make some good points, but once you acknowledge this is the way they do it, and we all know the way they do it, um, UNLV is going to have a hard time getting in that conversation given the damage that it did in Quadrant 4. And frankly, this is the exact same conversation we should we could have about South Florida. It, it's the same thing. I almost I almost injected South Florida, but I know we're tighter on time today. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the same right thing. Like I I would you know if you want me to say South Florida doesn't have the big it doesn't even have the same amount of wins though. Like right. UNLV has a better case in South Florida right now, I think in my opinion. Yeah, it's it's just like if you want me to say GP, would you like to see South Florida and UNLV in the NCAA tournament instead of some mediocre, you know, Big Ten team or SEC team or Big Twelve team or whatever? Sure, yeah, I would like that. Both those teams have had incredible seasons, especially lately. Um, but that's not the way we do it. And the way that the process um, is is going to unfold is not going to be kind to UNLV and South Florida, even if those two teams are, are doing really, really impressive stuff right now.